Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jeremy Castagna. I'm working with Dr. Hedingren here, and we're doing uh, some work with we're doing some work with some real-time model predictive control with mixed and nominator programming. Most of you already know what mixed and nominator programming is. So I'm just going to go through this real fast. So it's this idea where you have both continuous and discrete variables, and you're trying to optimize the object detection, objective function that they use as these variables. And so to test our this idea of real-time optimization, for mixing and learning programming problems, we're using a, a benchtop system. It's called the PCT40, and what it is is it's just a, a basic process control unit. It has a large process vessel and, uh, that we use to the gravity train tank, basically that we're using um, to test our objective function. So basically, our objective function is that we want to keep the tank level at 100 millimeters, and uh, our variables that kind of affect this are both a proportional solenoid valve, so a valve that can go from like 0 to 100%, and you can hit all the values in between it, of a discrete valve, which is on or off, so it's like the binary value we have. And so both these variables are things that we can control to reach the objective function, we're trying to optimize it real time and real systems. Okay, so moving on. The first thing I needed to do was to connect, and uh, make an interface that would connect the computer to it, the math lab, and basically what I did is I created a custom MATLAB library that connects to the PCT40. And what it does is it calls next function, which is a C code in MATLAB that communicates with the PCT40. And so this library I created has full control over all 25 sensors and control devices with the device. And you can just see it's very, very simple code just down below about how to interact with it. And so in this library, we have full control over how to interact with the device and also be able to optimize its decision. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is to create a model because this is model predictive control. And so the governing equation of the model is just a simple uh, a math balance. So it's first principle. So as you can see here, it's just, uh, as you can see here, it's just a simple math balance that goes in there. So that's the governing equation is a first principle model. However, the QN and the QOut uh, come from a lot of empirical relationships. So the inlet flow um, is strictly an empirical relationship that I had to now basically determine how do you determine what the inlet flow is based upon whether the discrete valve is on and whether the proportional solenoid valve is on. And so it's basically got three terms in it, which is uh, one is an empirical quadratic extent, which basically will give you the flow based upon how much the PSV is open, whether it's 100% or 80% or 90%. And then uh, solenoid one flow is just a constant because if you turn it on, it's always just going to be that specific flow rate. And then I kind of have this other step, which is just called an interaction parameter, because there's something interesting that happens is if you turn this one on, the solenoid is free valve on, and also the PSV, it doesn't actually equal the actual flow rate. It doesn't combine to that. So basically, it, I made this interaction parameter that kind of determines what is the true flow, flow rate. So basically, the interaction is equal to what the actual flow rate is minus this one together. And so with this model, I was able to accurately predict kind of what is the true inlet flow rate into uh, the actual process vessel. And then the uh, outlet flow was modeled with a semi-empirical model. And basically, it uses the principle of Bernoulli's equation, which you can determine what the flow is going to be based upon the height of the tank. What there is is there's a valve at the very bottom of the tank. And so the higher the water is, the more the flow rate that's going to come out based upon Bernoulli's principle. And what I did is we just, we just fit Bernoulli's principle to some constant. And so that was just a semi empirical model. And so you put these two models together, the Q and the Q out, into the governing equation. And that becomes the model that we're using. And so all these model constants were fixed after about three, about three test runs. And so we use these models to be implemented into APM and with MATLAB. And so MATLAB is the controller that's communicating with a server, which is called, uh, which is APM, which uses Solver, which is APOP, which is a mixed integer nonlinear programming solver. And so we're going to look at some of the results right here about, um, how it's working. So the first thing that you can see right here, you have four graphs right here. One is the level graph. This is the level up inside the tank. Uh, this graph over here 
shows, this is that endless flow model I was talking about, the one that had like the three turns. The blue line is the actual flow, and the green line is predicted flow. Uh, you can kind of see that the model does really well that I had used the uh, creative empirical model to predict the actual endless flow. And the last, the bottom left, this is the PSV percent, so from 0% to 100%. And the one to the right is whether the solenoid one, the discrete valve, is on or off. So zero is off, one is on. So the first thing I did is I set it to a set point of 100 millimeters. And the solver solved for it immediately, and it jumps off the PSD to 100%, and it turns on the solenoid one valve. And so once it reaches its set point, though, right here, what you'll see happens is it turns off the solenoid valve, and then it decreases the PSD to 50% to keep it at a steady state of 100 millimeters. Okay, so I, I thought I thought that was interesting that it used the solver and it did it really well. Then what I did is right here, uh, where is it? Okay, right here, I got the disturbance variable. What I did is I plugged the bottom of the tank. And so this was in part of the model and I wanted to see how was it going to react when I plugged the tank. And what it did is instead of, you know, turning on the, the solenoid valve or anything, it actually just decreased. It decreased the PSV just appropriately, and then I let my finger down again, and then it went back up. So it did a really good job responding to a small disturbance in the model. Um, the next slide gets a little more interesting. Um, this slide, what I did is I changed step point. So from here, I changed the step point from 100 to 150, and what you'll see is it turns back on the solenoid valve again, just like it was, as you would expect. And then once it reaches the set point, right up here, it, of course, turns it off again. And then you can see uh, more set point changes here as well, and it does very similar things. Um, but basically what I noticed is that for um, large set point changes, it'll turn the solenoid valve on. For medium ones, it'll turn it on. For small ones, it'll turn it on. But for very small set point changes, which is like one or two millimeters, it won't turn on the solenoid valve. It'll simply just... Uh, use the PSV to change the flow rate. So it's smart enough to figure out it doesn't need to, to turn on the discrete valve to make it work. Okay, and the last thing that I just wanted to show was right here. Is, uh, what I did here is I caught another disturbance, a very large disturbance in the model. And what I did is I opened up uh, a third valve, which basically lets all of the water exit out of the tank, and a lot of water exits. And when that happens, it's not part of the model. And so what happens is the solenoid valve actually turns on and off, on and off many, many times. And so you can see the flow rate just going crazy. So when there's a disturbance that's very large in the model, something that it's totally not accounting for, the model breaks down and the model predictive control, the solving just doesn't work very well. And all of a sudden, the solenoid valve is on and off. And so if there's small disturbances in the model, I notice that it's able to handle it. But if there's large disturbances in the model, meaning you change things that where the model doesn't really accurately capture what's going on, then you're going to have very large issues with your responses. And just to get some information about how much time it takes to do these things, um, for the CPU time, it takes uh, about 1.6 to 2.4 seconds for it to solve. And just want to point this out. What this means is that means it's the time it takes to, to pull the device. That means to get the information from the device to upload that information to the server, for them to solve that information, to solve the, the mixed integer and all your programs problem, then to download the information, and then to, to write that to the device. So that's a lot of stuff going on with about two seconds. So we're pretty pleased with how fast it's able to do it. And it usually solves it in iterations between four to seven seconds. And obviously this goes really fast because it's a very simple model, but it still gives us hope that, you know, these things can be done that you can do real time mixed integer and nonlinear programming problems and you can do them real time. Uh, these are basically just the initial results. We just came in about three or four days ago and started working on it. But so far we're, we're really happy with it. But the next thing that we really want to do is to be able to say, how can we handle disturbances in the model? Can we do some dynamic optimization where we can change the constants in the model? Like for example, the the equation right here. Let me show it to you. This equation right here was the one that starts becoming smaller here. This is the equation that gets flawed when I uh, when I release I made a large disturbance in that um, in the model when I opened up that valve. So what can we do to maybe change this constant right here? Can we say you have the ability to change this constant if you see that the mass balance isn't working? 
so that it can, you know, dynamically heal itself to model things and tune itself as it does. It. And so that's the next step that we're really interested in taking. Uh, that's basically the, my model and, and everything that has to do with it. Okay, thanks, Jeremy. Um, let's have uh, just a couple questions for Jeremy, and it looks like we're about out of time. Um, so any questions for Jeremy? Jeremy, you're assuming that you won't have the online flow measurements, which is why you're developing an empirical model. Is, is that right? I know I have online flow measurements as well, um, but I'm actually using what I'm using is the empirical model to give it. But I have both, and it extends both. Okay. Okay. But yeah, it does have online flow measurements. That's the actual the blue line that was there before. Where is it? Let me show you. Like that blue line right there. In the I wanted to do was I just wanted to make that empirical model to kind of to show that. Okay. All right. Hey, any other uh, any other questions? Okay. Um, so, Jeremy, one one question. Um, now, the uh, the total time was about two seconds. How much how much time was the solver actually taking? The solver when I pulled that. Took about 0.2 to 0.25 seconds. Okay. So, you know, the interesting thing is this is a problem that's about as large as the one that Wes was solving, but I think it's just more linear. Um, you know, there are some nonlinear terms there, but um, you know, the underlying model itself, uh, you know, just the mass balance is fairly linear. So, you know, there's I'm. I've seen this on some other benchmark problems as well. There's a huge disparity in uh, CPU times, depending on the technique that you're using. Um, so uh, it's an interesting, um, something that I want to look into a little bit more and see you know, why why there's that huge disparity. Mark, um, I had a question for you. When you were solving your de-optimal design, you were solving, um, were you solving with YALMIP, is that right, the software package? Yes, and it was calling a C to my, although it could call, it could call you know, lots of, uh, you know, convex uh, solvers. So how long did it, you were solving a mixed integer, a mixed integer non, or linear programming, right? Yeah, I, I ended up having a, it, it was all convex, so, um, and, so it, it really solved pretty efficiently. Um, in some cases, when I was solving um, a design based on integral controllability, that's non-convex, and so I, I just went through the the uh, an initial convex problem uh, with the de-optimal approach, and then used that to kick off the the, the non-convex problem. Okay, you initialized it with the convex problem. Right. Right. Okay. Okay, well, great. Um, any other questions for Jeremy? All right, fantastic. Well, thanks, everyone, for joining.